Moving on with our exam, question number 35, a chart with natural scale of one to 160,000 is classified as what? Well, you can see from the answers here that um, there's a couple different types of chart titles, sailing charts, general, harbor, and coastal charts. And these all hopefully make intuitive sense, like uh, harbor charts are for kind of closing in on your harbor, coastal charts are as such, general charts are maybe fairly bigger area, and then sailing charts uh, might not be as intuitive, but it's for larger scale uh, ocean stuff. So you can see in Bowditch, they have uh, descriptions of them based on the scale. But just to clarify the scale, this is one equals 160,000. So one inch on the chart equals 160,000 inches in real life. So that will hopefully guide you to the correct answer um, if you don't happen to have those memorized. The next question is a pretty interesting one. An important lunar cycle, referring to the moon, that affects the tide cycle is called the nodal period. How long is the cycle? Well, the correct answer is slightly under 19 years. It's about 18.7 or 18.6 years. But uh, taking a look at the answers here, you got an, something on the order of 16 days, which is two weeks, um, something on the order of 20 years, something on the, on the order of six years, and something on the order of 18 days. The 16-day thing is kind of the new moon to full moon cycle. Um, uh, and then the 19 years refers to our nodal period. The nodal period has to do with the orbit of the moon. Sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's further away. It's also inclined to the Earth's ecliptic by about 5 degrees, so that's a challenge there. The 6-year cycle, I'm not too sure what that one refers to. Likewise, with the 18 days, it's similar to the 16 days there and the number is close to the correct answer. So the correct answer is 19 years. Um, you can see on the descriptions in Bowditch about the, the nodal period and the cycles of the moon affecting our tides. So it's a pretty fun thing to read if you get some time. Uh, number 37, what does not contribute to commercial GPS receiver position error? Um, this one is guided to let you know that, or it's hoping that you know that GPS is based on time signals. And so uh, you see images of GPS and stuff, but really what's happening on the Earth, you know, if your position is somewhere on the Earth, then uh, GPS works by having a whole bunch of different satellites up in space. You know, there's dozens of them, but you need at least three or four to get a signal. And they send time signals out in all directions and you receive that time signal here on Earth, and you know when it was sent, you know when it was received, so therefore you can tell the distance from that um, satellite. And then if a different satellite, for instance, this one here sent out a time signal as well, it sends it in all directions, but it's most important where you receive it. You know when it sent its signal, you know uh, its distance, therefore, because of the speed of propagation of these signals. So you can infer your position based on having a whole bunch of these satellites. So looking at things that would um, contribute to commercial error, it's saying what does not contribute to error? Well, the satellite clock, so up in space, the Air Force is required to reset the clocks on the satellites quite frequently due to an effect called time dilation. In essence, since they're moving super fast, time literally slows down for the satellites. It's pretty cool. Features a lot in sci-fi if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. Um, but anyway, satellite orbits are continually changing, so if they need to boost or reduce their orbit, that'll affect the distance from you and therefore the amount of time that things can take. The atmospheric and ionospheric propagation is definitely something that can contribute to error. So in an area of um, extreme ionospheric activity, uh, the signal could be propagated a little bit differently. But what does not contribute to commercial GPS position error? The ship's speed. So the system is designed so that your ship has really nothing to do with it as long as you can receive the signal. So the correct answer would be 37 ships, for 37 would be ship's speed. Uh, number 38, atmospheric pressure can be measured with what? Well, if you look at all these answers, barograph, aneroid barometer, mercurial barometer, hopefully you've heard of barometers before, but in Bowditch, there's a description of them. Um, and so an aneroid barometer works by metal heating at different rates. A mercurial barometer works at mercury experiencing atmospheric pressure. A barograph is just a barometer attached to a diagram so that it can kind of trace the barometric pressure over time. 
And so therefore the correct answer would be all of the above. If you think of pressure, you should think of barometer. The next question, conveniently enough, number 39, atmospheric pressure at sea level is equal to what? Which of the following? Well, this is um, a little bit tricky if you rush to the answer. Um, I know as a scuba diver, for instance, 14.7 PSI is, is uh, sea level pressure. Um, when I took meteorology courses, I learned that 1013 and a quarter millibars is equal to sea level. Um, and 29.92, I've learned as a sailor with a barometer, I can see that. So all of these answers make sense to me. Uh, that's good because they're all correct. But if you needed to find this answer, it's in Bowditch. There's a table which has conversions, and there's some really cool ones in there. Um, for instance, the parsec is in there regarding a distance in space. But anyway, more to the point, uh, for the atmospheric stuff, they are listed in Bowditch, and you can get all these conversions that way. All right, we're tearing through this one. These are all trivia questions. Number 40, the area of strong westerly winds occurring between 40 degrees south and 60 degrees south latitude is called what? Well, um, this is a colloquial term for it, but if you look at a picture of the earth between 40 and 60, there's um, not much land in the way. So the winds just kind of continually blow in that region. It makes for strong winds and strong seas. And the nickname for them is the Roaring Forties. You can remember it's because it's near 40 degrees south. Um, the other name for them is the Furious Fifties because they're at 50 degrees south. But just to look at the other answers, the polar easterlies refer to uh, the eastern, eastern winds that are generated near the poles due to the global atmospheric circulation. And just a quick rundown on global atmospheric circulation. If, uh, if this is the Earth, and you imagined that uh, the Earth was like your shower in your bathroom, it's really hot here, and so therefore air tends to rise. It's really cold up here and here. Sorry, here and here. So air tends to be sinking there. So if you had a earth that was not rotating, air would just flow from the equator to the pole in this kind of cycle called a uh, Hadley cell. But since the earth is rotating, then you have to take into account the uh, Coriolis effect. And in essence, what you end up with, broadly speaking, on the earth is uh, three areas of winds. At the equator, you tend to have the trade winds blowing from the east. In the southern hemisphere, they're from the southeast. In the northern hemisphere, they're from the northeast. And then between like 30 and 60 degrees, you end up with different winds. You've got prevailing westerlies, generally, down to 60. And then above that, at the poles, you have polar easterly winds. So they're also from the east in both directions. So you can look this up on the internet if you've got questions, but to refer to the answers, the polar easterlies would not be correct. Those are generally above 60 degrees latitude, um, either in the northern or southern hemisphere. The jet streams, that's something that kind of refers to uh, winds up high in the atmosphere. So uh, that wouldn't apply there. The prevailing westerlies are generally between 30 and 60. However, there's a particularly strong westerly wind in this vicinity. So you can see why that answer might be correct, but the nickname for it is the Roaring Forties. It is found in Bowditch, but Wikipedia does a better answer, a better job explaining it if you do want to read about it. <laughs>